get me. From Studio A in Arcata, behind the redwood curtain, it's time for Suckatash. Yes, Suckatash, the comedy soundcast, soundcast featuring snippets from comedy. Soundcast. And also interviews with comedians, comedian soundcasters, and other showbiz folk. And now, here's this episode's host from up the coast, the man who puts the X in Xbox and the tie on antisocial, comedy soundcast soundcaster, Tyson Saner. Saner. Thank you, Bill Haywatt. Saluton, Estes, me, Tyson Saner, welcoming you to this episode of Suckatash that numbers 341. This is the first episode that I've put together since putting together my 100th episode for episode 339. Yes, you heard me correctly, 339. If this is your first time here, I should explain that my hosting duties are shared in a more or less every other weekly trade-off with show creator and executive producer Mark Hershon. Last week, for episode 340... Mr. Hershon brought you a Chats episode, in which was featured special guest Dr. London Smith of the Jock Doc podcast. It's a very entertaining episode that you could check out at your earliest convenience by going to our home site, www.suckatashshow.com, where you can find the entire archive of shows going back to March of 2011. Or, I guess you could just use whatever podcast streaming service you're currently listening to us on and go back a week. That would probably work, too. This week in show 341, I've got clips from the soundcast known as the Bancroft Brothers Animation Podcast, Willie Shakers, and the Hollywood Experience. It is possible that I will also have a classic advertisement from our longtime fake sponsor Henderson's Pants to share with you, but I don't like to speculate this early in the program. If you listen to episode 340, you will have heard a new advert from those aforementioned fictional freeloaders, which was quite enjoyable to hear, so that's cool. Anyway, let's get to the clippage without further ado. First up, the Bancroft Brothers Animation Podcast from the Bancroft Brothers. Its show description says, Twin animators Tom and Tony Bancroft get together and talk about their Disney animation past, the present animation business, and the future of animation. Interviews with talented artists, inspirational words, and wild speculation will help you grow as a person. Or not. The clip I have selected is from... October 21st, 2022. It's an interview with Henry Selleck. Its episode description says, Oh yeah, we got the director of A Nightmare Before Christmas talking with the Bancrofts in Halloween month. Better yet, we not only talk about that classic film, but also his new upcoming Halloween film, co-written and produced with the great Jordan Peele. Wendell and Wilde coming from Netflix. If you love creepy stop-motion films, for example, Corpse Bride, Coraline, Frank and Weenie, anyone then this is the podcast episode for you. Here's your clip. I have so many fond memories of Nightmare Before Christmas. It's it's one of the things that I've always wanted to talk to you about. Um, Same here, yeah. Uh, can I jump in, Tony? So yeah, I Tom. remember this time, this was 19, it came out in 1993. Yeah. And two years later, Toy Story come, comes out, 1995. But Tony and I were at Disney during those years making, you know, The Lion King and things like that. Those kind of movies. Yeah, things but, like that. It was right. a huge, a huge. Uh, that was a big I one. know, but it's like, it, that was like, that was like the boring stuff, the 2D stuff. That no, but I, yeah, and that's kind of where I was going. going. Exciting. Yeah, yeah, you got, what we would see in dailies, though, was this Nightmare Before Christmas first, and then later on, some Toy Story uh, scenes and sequences. And it was really exciting time at Disney is what I'm saying is that not only were we firing kind of on all pistons at, in the 2D side, but they were really experimenting. And this was Kathleen Gavin's. They kind of gave her this area. I think they called it special projects at the time or something like that. Um, yeah. Or no, a different word. It was something even funnier than that. But it was sort of like this oddball group out doing this thing. And, and I think John Lasseter would even say now that, they were kind of left alone. And you were just talking about that too. Being a little bit more left alone, we weren't under the scrutiny probably that the 2D animated films were. And yeah. I think that led to some amazing work coming out. Um, and I, where I'm, I'm headed, I'm going to go on a little tangent here, is just how did you find the 2D, uh, not 2D, the stop motion animators? Because this really was a dead art. I think that's what I want our audience to know is, 
is that really stop motion had been kind of killed off and was gone. And you really, this film helped bring it back. So can you tell us about where you found all those people? Um, it was, I mean, the, re the real death knell uh, kind of came or seemed to come when Jurassic Park, when they had to decide, are we going to go yes. with Phil Tippett and his amazing stop motion dinosaurs or this new fangled CG? And then they chose the CG and, and did incredible work. Um, but I here is here's when I found the animators. Um, you know, I did I did some of the early MTVs myself, but two sources. One I, ILM. Uh, there were people there. I didn't work with Phil Tippett yet, and I never. I mean, I I know him well, and I I use his studio to do tests, to do a short film. But Tom Sanamon, he was. Um, he was very generous. He was someone who had, who had been a stop motion animator and he built the armatures. He was like old school. He could build these as, as good as humans could build them. You know, he had replicas of, of King Kong that were perfect. Absolutely right. But he helped, he helped me out, um, stop motion animating. But the real miracle is that there was a new uh, Gumby series being done nearby that Art Clokey had had his old show revived, had rented out a, an old schoolhouse in Sausalito, just north of San Francisco. Yeah. And I don't know how he did it, but he like put out the flyers and kids from all across the country came to, to work on that film. Oh, that's and, great. And the good ones rose to the top quickly. People like Eric Layton and, uh, Trey Thomas, Tim Tim Hiddle, Angie Glocka, um, and on and on. And so mm -hmm. we basically, I, I I started working with some of those people while they were still doing Gumby at night. I tried them out on on some MTV things, and um, and then Gumby ended, and then I got a bunch of commercials for Pillsbury Doughboy and and Ritz Bits and stuff, and uh, so. I mean, at the end of the day, uh, I have Art Clokey to thank and his series for <laughs> happening to have a revival and then all those people needed other work. That's so uh, funny. I, I thought for sure it was going to be uh, what you talked about historically when Jurassic Park went CG that ILM didn't have any more work for their stop motion. Did you get some of those ILM animators too? Um, there, there, there never were that many. Um, and yeah, most they only of them, a couple, right? Yeah, yeah. Most of the switchover. Tom Sanamon, he be he came on as a full time armature maker and an animator. So he animated uh, some some of the uh, scenes in in the uh, Nightmare Before Christmas, and he and the trainees he had built all the armatures. Um, Randy Dutra, he ended up coming over. Um, he'd been doing some stop motion there. He um, sculpted a lot of characters for us. Mm -hmm. um, so there was, there was a, a bit of crossover, but it was almost 95% Gumby people. Oh, that's amazing. So you can reach out to the show on Twitter at Bancroft Bros. That is capital B-A-N-C-R-O-F-T, capital B-R-O-S. The guest, Henry Selleck, uh, does not appear to be on social media that I could find. Tom Bancroft and Tony Bancroft can be found at Tom Bancroft 1, that is capital T-O-M, capital B-A-N-C-R-O-F-T, and the numeral 1. And Tony Bancroft can be found at Pumba Guy 1, at all lowercase P-U-M-B-A-A-G-U-Y, and the numeral 1. The show does have a Patreon that you can find at www.patreon.com forward slash Bancroft Brothers, all lowercase spelled the same as before, except Brothers fully spelled out. Next up, Willie Shakers from Billy Armstrong. Its show description says, A podcast where I talk about how much I love Willie. I hope if you listen, you will love Willie too. No, please, get your mind out of the gutter. I mean William Shakespeare. So put the kettle on, grab yourself a cuppa, and get your Willie out with me. Clip I've selected is from the first episode, which posted on January 5th, 2023. And it's called Much Ado About Nothing, Act 1. Colon. Good news, everybody. So the episode description says, Welcome to Willie Shakers, a podcast all about the great bard William Shakespeare. 
Come join me for our look at the opening act of Much Ado About Nothing, a classic enemies-to-lovers rom-com. Meet the cast in Messina. The witty Beatrice, whiny Benedict, naive hero, old Leonato, double bastard Don John, love doctor Don Pedro, oh, and nice guy, in quotes, Claudio. So, here's what you need to know before we dive into Much Ado About Nothing. Much Ado is set in Messina. And this is a port town on the island of Sicily. During the time in which the events of the play take place, the island was under the rule of Aragon. No, not the king of Gondor. The Spanish kingdom which Henry VIII's first wife was originally from. Most of the action takes place at the estate of Governor Leonato, as he hosts some royal guests over the a month or so, of basically non-stop partying, you know, celebrating the end of a war. So, without further ado... Much Ado About Nothing, Act 1. Good news, everybody. As the play opens, Leonato is just chilling with his family in Messina. His daughter Hero and niece Beatrice are with him. I like to think that these guys have been, you know, day drinking for a bit. They're rich, the scenery's beautiful, and the weather's lovely, so why not? Leonator has received a letter informing him that now the fighting is over, the Prince of Aragon, Don Pedro, and his entourage are on their way. Leonator and his household are eagerly awaiting the party's arrival. Leonator discusses with the messenger how the fighting went and how many losses Aragon has suffered. The messenger replies, But few of any sort, and none of name. Basically saying, no one important is dead. This is amazing news. Leonato rejoices. A victory is twice itself when the achiever brings home full numbers. You know, this is really setting the tone for the play. We know the conflict is over. No main characters have suffered any personal loss. There's no need to mourn and be sad. Just relax and let the good times roll. Here we get a name drop for Claudio, who it seems is now the prince's right-hand man, due to his valiant efforts on the battlefield. Leonato is also overjoyed, as he knows Claudio's uncle. The messenger tells of how the old man was overcome with joy to hear of his nephew's return and his valiant efforts during the campaign. Now, Beatrice, being the sassy-ass queen she is, starts to inquire about a mysterious man. She calls him Signor Montanto. This confuses the messenger, until Hero eventually jumps in to say that she's talking about Benedict of Padua. I absolutely love Beatrice. From the moment she opens her mouth, she is pulling none of her punches. She says about Benedict, In our last conflict, four of his five wits went halting off, and now is the whole man governed by one. She asks the latest messenger who his latest sworn brother is. The messenger informs him that he is very close with Claudio. I actually laughed out loud at the next part when reading it, as she begins to compare Benedict to a disease. She says, God help the noble Claudio, if he have caught the Benedict. At this, the messenger is all like, This girl is hilarious. I've got to hang out with her. I've also read this as Beatrice perhaps playfully flirting with the messenger. 
as the play goes on, you, you kind of see how much of a flirt she can be. So, finally, the men arrive. We finally meet the prince, Don Pedro and his new friend, Count Claudio. And they are all welcomed with open arms by their old friend, Leonato. Also with them, we have a bard by the name of Balthazar. Balthazar Count 1, keep track. And Don John, the prince's bastard brother. Oh, and let's not forget the infamous fuckboy himself, Benedict. Almost immediately, Beatrice and Benedict start crossing verbal swords, exchanging witty blows back and forth, with Beatrice greeting Benedict with... I wonder that you would still be talking, Signor Benedict. No one marks you. This leads into my favourite sparring match, where they agree that anyone who should marry the other should be pitied. The only matter it would seem they have any agreement for. Now this show is written and performed by Billy Armstrong, who I cannot find on Twitter. But the show does have a Facebook that is at Willie Shaker's Assemble, which is all lowercase W-I-L-L-Y-S-H-A-K-E-R-S-A-S-S-E-M-B-L-E. And you can email the show at willie.shakers at hotmail.com. That's W-I-L-L-Y dot S-H-A-K-E-R-S at hotmail.com. Also, if you go to willieshakers dot buzzsprout, spelled B-U-Z-Z-S-P-R-O-U-T dot com, you can find the show's main website. This portion of Succotash is brought to you by Henderson's, innovation in pantaloons and trousers since 1896. Almost 80 years ago, when Grandpa Al Henderson was struggling to raise a family during the Great Depression, he did what any unemployed family man would do, he shoplifted food. But he did it the right way and never got caught, because he used his patented Henderson's kleptomatic trousers, made with pride in the USA with not four, not five, but eleven expandable pockets that drape and shape naturally while stylishly concealing fresh fruits and vegetables, eggs, even live poultry, and feed a family of five while never once alerting market vendors or law enforcement officials. Well, as they say, everything old is new again. And now, Henderson's is proud to offer Kleptomatic Plus, microchip equipped to neutralize barcode scanners, exit alarms, and other loss control detectors, so you can walk through any door with confidence. That's Henderson's Kleptomatic and Kleptomatic Plus trousers, helping you provide with confidence in every stride. And now, back to more of Succotash. Thank you, Bill Haywatt. Finally tonight, The Hollywood Experience, from Adrian Paul. Now, I clipped this soundcast originally for episode 294, titled Celebrity Adjacent, which dropped a bit over a year ago on March 1st, 2022. For those of you who didn't hear it last time, its show description says, Actor, producer, and director Adrian Paul, who has over 200 hours of television and more than 35 film credits to his name, talks with actors, comic book creators, martial arts masters, showrunners, stunt professionals, and many others who have helped shape some of the most famous action films and TV shows in pop culture history. The clip I've selected is from episode 52 from January 16th, 2023, not that long ago. It's an interview with Claudia Christian. The episode description says, Happy New Year, and thank you for joining us for this new episode of The Hollywood Experience. Claudia Christian is an actress, author, and activist. She has had a lifelong career in the entertainment industry, and her role in Babylon 5 put her in the spotlight as a sci-fi icon. She also lends her voice to some of the most popular video games. Enjoy listening in as Adrian catches up with Claudia and finds out what she's doing now. Thank you for uh, joining me today. I know we've been... <laughs> Sort of rushing. We talk about the weather, but yeah, actually, that's very English. You know, that's the other. The I know it's terribly English, darling. We talk about the weather just to break the ice. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. You know, it's the other thing that the English do. That whenever you go to the theatre and somebody's done a, a play that is not the best, the word they always use is interesting. Oh, that was very interesting. Or, <laughs> it was really. Or that was, oh, that was brave. That was very brave of you. Very brave, <laughs> of you, darling. I'm not quite sure what to say. Anyway. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I kind of love it. I I love the Brits. Yeah. Oh. Well, um, 
I want to talk a little bit about um, where you kind of started uh, way, you know, because uh, you're from Glendale originally, right? Um, well, I was born in California, but I was raised on the East Coast in Connecticut and yeah. um, went, went uh, to, then came back to um, California when I was around 14 and I went to, to Lambda briefly. Uh-huh. Um, and I, uh, I basically got a drama scholarship and turned it down because I thought my best earning years would be 16 to 30. That was my, that was my mentality back then. So I did high school in two and a half years and I left home at 16 years old. I got a manager. Um, I lived alone in Los Angeles at 16. And That's brave. <laughs> That's very brave, darling. Yeah. <laughs> That's brave, Claudia. It's interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, and I was really lucky enough to um, to have a couple. I had saved up money for modeling, and so I and also I worked four jobs to get through high school in two and a half years. I work experience, GED. Mm. So I had enough money to to take some classes and take headshots. And I met a manager, and she kind of prepped me by sending me on go sees, which you remember, Adrian probably. Oh. Yeah, go sees yeah. used to be this wonderful thing where you would go and meet a top casting director and yeah, that casting right. director would keep you in mind and they would know you. They'd spend at least a half an hour chatting to you, get to know you. They remembered you and they'd say, Oh yeah, uh, Claudia would be great for this. And it was really a wonderful way to meet all of the top casting directors. Yeah. In of course that is obsolete now. Um, so I met a bunch of casting directors between 16 and 18 because I looked much older than I was because I was my own, my height, my full height, my voice was low. So my manager said, you're never going to, no one's going to hire you at 16 to play 16. You don't look 16. They'll hire an 18 year old to play 12. You know, it it, it makes no sense. So I had to wait till I was 18. But in the meantime, I was studying with all the best acting coaches, um, Peggy Fury. uh, Yeah. Studying with, um, uh, uh, what's his face? Larry Moss. uh, Also, also, Larry, Larry, yeah, all these different acting coaches, and um, then did you, did you ever know Roy London? Yeah, I did know Roy London. I didn't study with him. No, I did. Um, I studied with Roy. Yeah, uh, I got kicked out of a few acting classes, but anyway. Okay, okay I want to hear that. Oh, okay. Now you just uh, you just piqued my interest. You got kicked out of acting class. What yeah, I got kicked with? out of an acting class by this guy Howard. I won't say his last name, but he. He there was a point when he was going on and on and on about a, an, an actress's choice of footwear for and not for she had a cold reading scene or or she had a scene that we were supposed to work on and it was her particular scene was from Little Women and she and and she just went up there in a pair of trousers and some shoes and did the scene and he went on and on and on about her footwear about her choice and how that shows that she was not a real actress because she chose tennis shoes and this was little women and all this bullshit and finally I stood up and I was all of you know 17 years old and I said that's what costumers are for move on <laughs> so, and I said that's not her job she will have a costume designer and a, and a wardrobe lady when it comes down to it. So why are we talking about this? Why are you wasting our entire class on her footwear? I was really ticked off. And he was also a bit of an a-hole. So he kicked me out. Um, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so well, let, let's say you, you didn't mince your words, did you? Well, seven. I was, he was already really annoying me because he would do this. He would go off on these little OCD tangents of stuff that was nonsensical and waste our it was expensive. Well, was, you're paying money for it as well, right? I was right? paying my hard-earned money, getting yeah. my butt pinched by by being a cocktail waitress. I lied about my age, and I was getting my butt pinched every night by a bunch of drunk guys. So it wasn't, you know, it was like I'm making three dollars an hour. You know, this is a lot of money for me. Anywho, by the time I turned 18, I had met all these great casting directors. My manager called one and said, "Do you have a five and under for Claudia so that she can get Taft Hartley and and get in the union?" And that casting director happened to cast Dallas and so I got a five and under on Dallas with Larry Hagman directing the episode explain the five and unders if people don't understand what that is okay five and under is five lines and under so that's really for beginning actors it's not even a co-star role a co-star is the next sort of level up you've got five and under co-star guest star recurring and series regular. This is television I'm talking about. Do they still do that today? I'm not sure if they still yes. do that. Yes. Because I know there's low, low budget where you pick up a lot of the, you know, there's, there's low budget and then there's low, low, low budget. You know, well, there's, 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 that's a whole different 
world, but in television, the parts are still um, segregated by five and under co-star guest star, good co-star they call it now, or or they'll say one day guest star, uh, which is actually a good co-star, but they're paying you a one day guest star rate. So there, there's all these little nuances in between those, but really those are the basis of the roles. And a five and under sounds it's exactly what it is. It's five lines or under. And mine was probably five lines that I had in an episode, but it was a pivotal scene. Um, and it was a it was a great way to dip my toe into television because prior to that I had only done theater. Right. So the show does not have a dedicated Twitter account, but starting with the guest, you can find Claudia Christian at Claudia Lives. That is capital C L A U D I A capital L I V E S. You can find some of the things she does at c three foundation dot org. That is all lowercase c t h r e e and then foundation f o u n d a t i o n dot o r g. The C3 Foundation is the world's only nonprofit organization dedicated to raising awareness of the Sinclair method for treating and preventing alcohol use disorder. And in case you were wondering, this process is also known as pharmacological extinction. See, the Sinclair method requires you to take a naltrexone pill, not sure how it's pronounced, an hour prior to drinking every time you drink. Your brain gradually learns to separate alcohol from the reward of intoxication, and so alcohol cravings gradually diminish. Also appearing on the program is co-host Ethan Detmeyer. You can find at Combat Radio on Twitter, that is C-O-M-B-A-T-R-A-D-I-O. And, of course, the host, Adrian Paul, can be found on Twitter at all lowercase A-D-R-I-A-N-P-A-U-L and the numeral 1. And the show's website, or at least the website they want you to visit, can be found at radio, the peace fund, dot org. That is R-A-D-I-O dot T-H-E-P-E-A-C-E-F-U-N-D dot O-R-G. And that brings episode 341 almost completely to a close. I do hope you found something enjoyable in what I've brought to you. It is my goal to provide at least three clips for the show I do every two weeks. And sometimes it is surprisingly difficult to be in the mood to listen to folks I've never heard speak before. Sometimes I just want to listen to one of my favorite soundcasts, and that does become a bit of a trade-off as far as time is concerned. Also, sometimes I'm not in the mood for comedy. Funny thing, that. I love comedy and comedians, but burnout is real. All in all, I do think that listening to various strangers have conversations over the years has essentially made me a better listener. There's not enough space in my brain at the moment to remember if I've pointed out that better listener thing out on the show before, but if I have, I can only apologize and say that it's just a true thing. I've had a lot of practice listening. Maybe one day I will be listening to you talking on a soundcast, and perhaps I will enjoy what I'm hearing so much I will try to find a clip from your soundcast to feature here on Suckatash assuming that by the time you have your soundcast recorded, edited, and published, that Succotash is still a thing. I don't see why it wouldn't be. It's just that time is a very real thing, and it appears to be nothing if not finite. On that note, tune in next week for show 342, where I imagine Mark Hershon will have something really neat for you to listen to. Thank you for listening. Be decent to each other. Go to www.tysonsainer.com to find links to the rest of the stuff I have put out in the universe. And until I talk at you again, please remember that there might be people in your life that would appreciate a suggestion of what to listen to on their own personal journey of Soundcast listenership. And if you do think of us as a possible suggestion for them, we will always appreciate it if you could please pass the Succotash. You've been listening to Succotash, the comedy soundcast, soundcast, with your host, Tyson Sainer, brought to you by Henderson's Pants and... Imagine your company's name right here. Rate us and review us at Apple and Google Podcasts. Find us on the web at SuccotashShow.com. On Stitcher. On iHeartRadio. On YouTube. On SoundCloud. And wherever fine soundcasts are streamed and or downloaded. Follow Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Suckatash Show. Like us on Facebook. Email us at tyson at succotashshow.com or call into the Suckatash Skype line at our toll call number 818 921 7212. You can also upload clips from your favorite comedy soundcasts directly to us using our direct upload link at hightail.com slash you slash Suckatash. Sarkatash is produced and engineered by Joe Paulino through the auspices of Studio P. Sausalito, the home of the hit.
Our hosts are Mark Hershon and Tyson Sainer. Our musical director is Scott Carvey. Our booth assistant is Kenny Durges. Suckatash is executive produced by Mark Hershon. Until next time, I'm your loyal booth announcer, Bill Haywatt, reminding you to please pass the Suckatash goodbye. This has been a Succotash Patch production. <laughs>